All right. Well, Bill Miller, uh, great to meet you. Great to have you on here. You're you're one of the guys where I follow on Instagram and this episode, like I've learned so much from what you've been putting out there and implemented it into my training um, with great results. But I'm also like a little bit hesitant in that I know the competitor, other my competitors are going to watch this. They're going to learn from you and they're going to get better. But, <laughs> you know, that's how it goes. It's it's part of the long drive community. We try to help each other be as fast as we can, hit the ball as far as we can. And that's one of the great things about the podcast. Uh, so thanks for being on. No, for sure. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. So uh, why don't you start by telling everybody kind of what you do and who you usually train? So I've been training baseball players now for about the last seven, eight years or so. Um, I played baseball myself. I played independent ball after college. And um, the big thing that I always tell people about like my career was I was a big, strong guy, um, probably the strongest guy at every level that I played. I could deadlift a lot. I could bench press a lot. But my speed component really wasn't there. And, you know, I wasn't throwing very fast, sprinting fast, and I didn't hit as many home runs as I probably should have in my career. And like I, that had always really bugged me. And so like when I got into coaching, not long after my career was over, I really wanted to say, okay, I want to figure out why this speed component wasn't there. Is it genetic? Am I just never going to be fast? And so on and so forth. So, um, not long after that, um, I actually did get into like some long drive training. It was actually just like self-experimentation with swinging a golf club for the swing speed radar, which gives varying results. It's definitely not how good of a long driver you will be. But um, I was just looking at the number. That's all I cared about. And so at the time, this is about four and a half, maybe five years ago now, I got really big into um, Chris Beardsley of Strength and Conditioning Research. And so I was going through his first mentorship program. And so we had talked a lot about like concepts of like how rate of force development occurs. What's the difference between someone who has great rate of force development and somebody who doesn't. And you know, these concepts of like rate coding, like the rate at which we recruit motor units through our brain and central nervous system. And so all he keeps telling me about is like, Bill, like you're strong as a house. We can measure this on like a force velocity profile. We'll measure that you are strong. That's great but you're lacking speed. So literally all I did for like a two month stretch in like upper body training was just speed stuff, med ball throws, plyometric pushups, a lot of experimental like rotational type exercises. And I swung once a week and my club head speeds kept going, going, going. And I don't necessarily think looking back on it, it was only from the training, but I think just by having that big, strong base already, and needing that speed component so much, like I was giving my body the opportunity to move fast, which is something mm-hmm. I never really did before in training. And club head speeds kept going up. Like I went 130 and then I got up to like 138 one day. Like it was, it was like I was going nuts. <laughs> and I, I eventually did crack like some 150s um, with the driver. So, and then I <laughs> crack, I wound up cracking a bunch of them off my back. And so I ran out of money. I couldn't keep spending, <laughs> you know, two, 300 bucks on a driver. So, I kind of um, called it quits on that. But yeah, over the years, I've stayed in like swinging shape to where if I go to like top golf or something, I'm still hitting the ball off the back net, no problem and stuff. But um, over the years, too, I've gotten very busy with my own training. So it's like I'm training eight pro guys now. I don't think I was training any pro players before. And those guys, I mean, they, they take a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And you they basically like – When they walk in the gym, I want them to like see a place that is super like well organized and well put together. And that takes some time too. Whereas before I would be in the gym just swinging like a madman and like kids would walk in the gym and it would be a mess and everything like that. So I'm trying to keep that, you know, more organized, I guess, to say. But long story short, that's basically why I started doing all like the rotational speed things that I did is because I wanted to figure out why I was lacking it in my baseball career. And I wanted to just try to apply it to something that I thought was cool. So anybody who's been listening to kind of the progression of this podcast over the last few months knows that I'm in a very similar situation to that, where my strength levels are very high and I don't feel like I'm maximizing that strength in terms of then converting it into maximum speed. 
And it's been a, a fun and frustrating journey to learn kind of that carryover. And um, I, I've done, it, it just seems like there's so much variance between individuals though. I know for me, I've implemented a lot of different like throwing, um, lead arm throwing, light different. So let's get into that later. But first, how would you kind of explain it when you have, and I don't know if it's the same in baseball, but in, in long drive, you have some of the fastest people who are just jacked, like huge muscle bound guys, really strong. And then you have some of the fastest people that are relatively weak. Like they're pretty thin. Mm-hmm. They're, they're still great athletes, but they're weak relative to those other guys. So how do they still develop so much speed in their different ways? Yeah. And I think a good follow uh, that I like to follow for these types of things is um, Stefan Jones. He works with a lot of cricket bowlers. He's got some great ideas on this, but the one thing that I've learned from him over the years is that, you know, when you have a guy, he calls them the quicks, you know, these smaller guys that are just super fast, super springy and explosive. They, when, when they go to produce force, there's so much more force transmission through like the stretch shortening cycles that are happening within our muscles, like muscle pulls on the tendon so it's not a big, strong muscle that's doing the job. It's the tendon that is really taking on some of that load. And the tendon is like a really strong spring and it can create force very rapidly up the chain and then it transmits uh, super, super fast. But it is an interesting thing because it is 100% the case in baseball. I mean, you have Mookie Betts who can hit balls 115 miles per hour and then you got Bryce Harper or you know, Aaron Judge, like these guys that are just ginormous that are also hitting the ball just as hard, if not harder, but Mookie Betts is hitting the ball harder than most guys that you'll find on the planet. So the, we have little guys that are producing the same end speed as big guys. And so why does that happen? Excuse me for a second. I want to tell you real quick about my favorite training aid and a sponsor of the podcast, the lag shot. It's designed with what they call lag flex technology. That'll help you to create and maintain more lag in your swing which will give you better consistency and more speed, which we all want, right? But my favorite part is that you can go out and actually hit balls with it. It's a real club. They make a driver, a seven iron, and a wedge. So you can incorporate it into your practice sessions to ingrain the better technique that it's teaching you. Once you try it, you'll see why I love it. Go to lagshotgolf.com crush or click the link in the description below to get 15% off. lagshotgolf.com crush. In my opinion... The concept of rate coding or the rate at which we produce force is – it's its almost like um, it's the end result. Like if you can produce force fast enough, it doesn't matter how big you are. Like it will – it will happen for you basically. Like you will hit balls very, very far if you can produce force fast enough. So I think it's that perfect combination of like force and velocity. Like that equals power. The guys that are very, very big and strong have good force, no doubt about it, but that velocity component is still really good, so they produce a great end power, whereas those guys who maybe aren't so big are probably still pretty strong. You know, like, I'm not saying that one rep max, they would be great, but I do a lot of testing with, um, like, a crane scale. There's other better force monitoring devices out there, but imagine you pull on this scale, and it tells you how many pounds of force you put in. Well, even some of these skinny guys that like on paper don't look like they're that big, they're still putting up pretty big numbers on this crane scale too. I'm Mm -hmm. talking like imagine like a lat pull down or a pullover type exercise or uh, even an isometric mid-thigh pull, something like that. Like like you'll see like even these skinny guys are like, whoa, this guy is still producing a lot of force. Even though if you put a bar in his back, he might not be the most impressive individual. So again, it's that combination of everything. Yeah, the the way you measure strength is one thing I for sure wanted to ask you about because exactly like what you're saying, you know, a squat, bench, and deadlift, that's like the old school way. Like how much can you lift that way? But it certainly does not carry over necessarily to sports. Um, It can, but not for everybody. And I know there are – like if you took an NBA player, they would probably, generally speaking, have a terrible squat just because their legs are so long. Their their ratio of torso to femur would would not be ideal, I'm sure. Um, But – some of them are, are incredibly strong, I'm sure. And so then is it the isometric things that are the best representative for carrying it over to sport? Do you do any like partial lifts, like a rack pull or what other metrics do you use for max yep. strength? So, yeah, like the, and the way that I like to think about it is, okay, 
in a squat, bench, and deadlift, those are three great movements, and we train them all every single week in some capacity with just about everybody I train. But as far as testing goes, in my opinion, you would like to get a testing environment that is more similar to the positions that you'll be in out in the field. It doesn't have to be the exact same positions, but in order to really target a certain area, like getting up overhead and being able to pull, a one rep max test is not going to be great for a pullover. Like it's just, it's super unsafe. I've tried it. It's soft. <laughs> but yeah, that seems risky. Yeah. But a crane scale where there is no failure involved, you just pull on the scale that it makes a lot more sense to be able to do that. So the, we do the overhead one a lot. We'll do a rotational one where if you imagine you're pulling from behind your body, kind of like a baseball swing start position, we'll do that with the lead arm because I think the lead arm is huge for transferring energy. Um, but we'll do both hands. We'll do the top hand as well, like in more of a punching type position. And then, yeah, like um, we'll do like a rack pull where we hook up the crane scale to the rack and do like a deadlift or an isometric mid thigh pull, something like that, as well as like a split squat. This year we've been going with um, like a rear foot elevated position on that one. Hmm. Just to create a little bit more of a difference and a little bit more true of like, this is like one foot on the ground instead of just like a split squat position. And that's been pretty cool to see. Um, the one thing that I will say, the one caveat with all this is that if you start isometric strength testing with a crane scale or anything, um, there's a couple problems with it. So the first problem that comes up is like within the first week or two of testing, numbers will spike through the roof with everybody just because they get good at producing force at that position. It's almost like a coordination mm -hmm. type thing. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, but I'm talking like 10 pounds of force could be up in a week. Um, so you do have to go through almost like those beginner gains to really see what, what they're really producing. Um, and then the other thing with it is, I wish I had this, I know they exist, but being able to measure rate of force development would be, that's the biggest thing. So it's not just about, oh, I hit 80 pounds in a pal off hold. Now I'm going to hit 400 yard, yard drives. No, if you could get to 80 pounds in a, like if we had it on a graph in a, like, a, like that, then of course you have the force to be able to do that. But there is a specific velocity at which you need to be able to produce that force. Um, if you're going to be great at baseball, golf, whatever. Um, so that's the, the two sort of things that I talk about. Like isometric strength testing is great. It's replaced a lot of the one rep max testing that I've done over the years, but it does have its sort of shortcomings, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the body will adapt pretty quickly, right? Especially for an athlete. And if you're if you're training that isometric movement, you'll probably get good at that. But then you need to switch it up and do something different, right? So but how? So it sounds like so rate of force development and force coding are roughly the same. Yeah, the force coding yeah, would that, be like the profile yeah, for, of yeah, for all intents and purposes, yeah. Okay, so then it seems like the rate of force development um, is like yeah, you know, inherently you'll you'll have a predisposition, but that's you can acquire that skill better, which would be sort of on the opposite. Well, I mean, you can still acquire this next one, but the maximum like um, output. I don't know why I'm blanking on the on the term. Mot not. Anyways, maximum force production, whatever you want to call it, that would be like the the purposeful strength that you were talking about, and so then you need to find that balance, right? So the I know you. I've also seen you use the Proteus. You use um, you measure the speeds with which you're throwing the ball. Are those like then metrics to kind of stand in and say, oh, that's approximately what your your rate of force development is, and like that's how we're going to be building on that. Mm Hundred -hmm. percent. Yeah. So the the lighter the load, the better the representation of how good you are at producing force quickly. Okay. So. Typically speaking, like when we get on the Proteus, we're working with like five pounds if we really want to stress or test the velocity end of the spectrum. And then if we want to do the force end of the spectrum, you could get heavier loads. I've done that in the past and seen good results with it. Like, for example, throwing like a 12 pound medicine ball overhead, like that's pretty heavy. It's a representation that if you throw that 12 pound med ball hard, relatively speaking, you're probably a pretty strong guy. But that all being said, um, I think where I've seen the best success with is like we did this today. We've done this like for the last six, seven months and it's been awesome. We'll superset between like a, 
max effort isometric movement on the crane scale, get a number there, rest 30 seconds, a minute, whatever, and then go to the Proteus or go to a med ball throw with a similar pattern. So for example, like the pullover, we'll isometric test the pullover or a lat pull down type movement. And then we'll go to the Proteus and do a pullover and we'll just, all right, we can see it happening in real time that you are increasing in both. We know you're more powerful now. So yeah. that's kind of a, a very simple way to like drive home both the force and the velocity ends of the spectrum. And now we're covering our bases. We don't need to really guess too much anymore. We're, we're doing it in real time. So that's something like I don't think – like, like there's always going to be the, like the shortcomings of like, Oh, this guy really needs strength or not. So you could spend a month in, in the weight room and only see a little bit of improvement. Right. It yeah. almost feels like you've wasted time, you know? Whereas if you're doing the isometric with the high speed movement, you're kind of getting the best of both worlds without a ton of wasted time. It feels like yeah. you know, there's a lot of stress in weightlifting. There's a lot of stress with everything that you do in training. At least that's how it should be if you want it to actually matter, you know, but if, uh, if you're kind of getting the best of both worlds at the same time, that's in my opinion, like my favorite way to go about it. Yeah. It does seem like just trying to build up strength. Um, what, you know, not linearly, but like some kind of an undulating periodization, whatever it is, it takes time. It just takes years of, of grinding and stuff like that. And then at the end, you've got a question, is that really the optimal way to prepare for your sport? Um, but going back to what you said, doing the contrast method like that, is there, so you and I know, and anybody who's listening, who's done that before knows like once you do that, once you do the heavy or, or the isometric, whatever it is, and then the peak velocity, your body feels so primed. Your, your nervous system is just like on fire and it feels amazing. Cause you know that that's like your optimal state. Is there a way then to get that in competition? Because you can't like, you're not going to go out on the baseball field or in long drive up on the tee and be able to do an isometric and then go, you know, so how do you, how do you make that carry over? Is it the idea Man. that basically you're just improving and, and it will carry over that way? Or is there a way to actually do that specific thing in competition? Yeah, it's, I think you kind of like touched on what the perfect world would be like if you are in your warm up before, like everybody gets to warm up before a long drive event, before a baseball game, what have you. And you know, you're going through some things like, oh, I go through my mobility, I go through rolling out, whatever. Okay, now take that last five minutes that you have to warm up and bust out the medicine ball. I mean, if you had a crane scale, that'd be great. If you don't, you know, just something max effort, something to, like you said, prime the central nervous system, get moving fast, be explosive. And guess what? If let's say you're out on a baseball field and you have a 12-pound medicine ball and you know that a chest pass with that 12-pound ball, you should be able to get it. 30 feet, no problem. But let's say you're in your warm up and you're like, man, I'm only at like 27, 28 feet right now. Obviously, you are not ready to go at that moment. So we should actually measure and see, hey, I know I need to get to 32 feet with this chest pass. And once I get to 32 feet, I know I'm ready to go. And so that's that readiness test that we can do. Like in your warm up, it takes literal minutes. And, um, it's a great way to make sure that you're firing on all cylinders and, and just getting the most out of either your training session or your game, your competition, what have you. Um, I do think like there's an aesthetic to it though, because I've had people ask me before, like, Oh, should we just have the crane scale in the dugout all the time and stuff? And it's like, no, there's nobody in like in the baseball world, at least that's going to go for that. But you can have something like in your warm up that like I don't think that's you know out of this world to have a medicine ball in your warm up setting like that's it seems pretty commonplace to me but um, yeah I don't uh, I don't think that would be too weird you do have to almost like schmooze the baseball player world into like no this is a good thing like it's <laughs> okay to move fast in your warm up you know so that's my take at least mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense I think it's the kind of thing where if if the players can see a really good player doing something, even if it's really weird, they're going to start, they're at least going to try it. And so if it looks yeah. goofy, if it, whatever it is, if it works ultimately and you want to win, you're going to do it. Yeah. But, and, and so to that point, this is a really interesting one. A guy that I trained with the Red Sox in, he's in the minor leagues, 
Fitzgerald, he had a great like start to his year out in the out in the spring training with the the big league team. And people are like, what the hell is this guy doing? He's literally like ripping a crane scale as hard as you hmm. can. Kind of like in spring training complexes, it's like it's not like you don't have like a tunnel. You have like the field and then you have like a little backfield area. So he's in like the backfield area um, by their locker room and he's just ripping this thing and he's throwing the medicine balls and stuff. And he did that like before every single game, like probably within five minutes of the national anthem. So he was like he was ready to go and he had a great spring training. So more people are like, wait, this is just like a normal 185 pound kid, but he's hitting nukes in the games right now. Like, Hmm, there is some, there might be something to this, but yeah, you're right. Like if you would have went out and like struck out every at bat, it'd be like, no, hell no, I'm not doing that, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, there's a guy who's on the PGA champions tour now. I, I, so he's an older guy, but he does the weirdest like warm up routine. He's, you know, doing like dance moves and stuff out in the driving range. And it looks silly if you see it because you're like, I don't know, you know, what that is, but he's one of the best players in the world. So mm-hmm. in my opinion, if that helps me and maybe I'll try it next time, but if that helps me, I mean, I'll do it. I, it, you know, whatever helps the performance, I think. But I wish I had known the different weight um, elements better when I was younger. I, I had a great training partner for years and, and we would throw medicine balls probably anywhere from two to three times a week. But we would always go with a heavier ball because we're just like, mm-hmm. hey, we're, we're strong. The, you know, a four or six or eight pound ball feels weird. It feels like we're hardly holding anything. And so we would go for a 20 pound ball usually. And, and we would just kind of, we'd go in this gymnasium and try different throws and see how far apart we could get from one another. And, and it was always a competition. Like if one person could get it to the other person, obviously that's motivation to work harder and to, and to get it, which is a lot of fun. Um, that's kind of a different way of measuring it, I guess, than the velocity. But yeah, I mean, so l- l- let's go back a little bit to when I, when I first saw you on Instagram, probably, oh, I don't know, five months ago now, I saw you doing lead arm throws or you know, yeah, lead arm throws. And that was, I'd never seen that before. I'd never done it before. So I got a ball, um, broke it, got another ball, tried, you know, tried a bunch of different stuff. And, and then of course you have to find a wall that can, you know, hold it. But, um, yeah. how did you come up with that movement? It's, it's pretty cool. I don't even remember why I started doing it. Like, I think I was, So I'm talking like six years ago now. I was really just trying to figure out like, if I'm being honest, like anything that was was like, oh, this is a correlation to this movement or, you know, whatever, right? So like I started tracking medicine ball throw velocity, like a rotational scoop toss with two hands. I did the shot put throw a lot. And I started just like, I think we had like this old like grandma ball, like like imagine like a three pound ball with a handle (laughs) on it that like, grandmas are doing like twists with and i'm like this thing's just been collecting dust like let me just try to start like swinging it and so i was trying to get it to swing for the radar i was like wait a minute why don't i just throw it and it read really good and before you know it like no shit everybody that had great exit velocities like 95 plus they were throwing the ball the hardest so it's like hmm that makes sense um and so probably the coolest thing that i've done recently with those is we hopped up on a 40 motion and which is basically another K vest type brand. And the 40 motion showed that when guys were throwing the ball, the hardest like velocity, there was almost like a 90% correlation with their best sequencing from like torso or hip to torso to arm to hand. And so Mm -hmm. like creating that uh, acceleration, basically like, um, if, if you saw it on a graph, it would make a lot more sense than what I'm going to say, but imagine like, okay, here's your pelvis. It's starting to, starting to go up. And then the next segment, the torso starts to go up and so on and so forth. And then the lead arm and the hand goes, all of their peaks lined up perfectly, even though they were starting their acceleration at, you know, hips go first, then the torso, then the lead arm and the hand. But it like all of them peaked at like the same time when guys were throwing the hardest. So I'm like, that's it. This is like a representation of a very efficient swing path because you're maximizing your hips, your torso, and your lead arm through your hand all at the same time. So you're going to get the most speed. And uh, that's really what we've been working with lately is rather than telling guys, hey, just start ripping this thing as hard as you can, I've been trying to use it almost as a marriage between like the batting cages and in the weight room and saying, okay, 
you're a very strong, powerful guy in the weight room. You're, you know, pretty good in the cages. Now we want to make sure that you're getting the most out of every single swing that you can. So now when a guy thinks, oh, I'm, I'm in the cages and I'm going to try to like swing hard and I'm going to try to hit the crap out of this ball, their first movement needs to be similar to what their best lead arm throws were. So if it's uh, a guy that's very, um, how do I say it? Like, like keeps their spine angle more, I would say like a steeper spine angle on the lead arm throws and that's what they get the best with. I would like them to maintain that spine angle a little bit more when they're hitting. So if they're popping up when they try to hit a baseball, that's probably not going to go too well. So that's just one example of how we use it. But I do like to make sure that guys have an understanding of, okay, with this ball in your hand, we're, we're removed from the cages. It doesn't matter because you're not hitting a ball. Like it doesn't matter what the mechanics of it are. You just have to, focus on getting the highest speed possible and that will show you what your best sequence is i really really like it because now guys don't have to worry about like this happens a lot in baseball and i'm I'm, i know speaking from experience at least in my own long drive experience like it happens with long drive too where it's like you could take a kinetically good swing and you could miss the damn ball and now you feel like shit about yourself Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like smash factor is probably the most important thing other than, you know, bat speed or, or swing club head speed, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, you want to take out that variable of you didn't hit a ball well. So now the swing was bad. You know what I mean? Right, I right. want yeah, guys to sure. learn. I want them to learn through the lead arm throws that you can produce a lot of speed like this, and you will figure out how to connect with the ball in the cages when you try to repeat this type of pattern, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It was really interesting when I first saw it because the emphasis is usually on the trail arm from from what I hear because in part, uh, a lot of long drivers, the fastest ones come from a baseball background and usually from pitching. So mm-hmm. then, you know, people, everybody talks about the release of the right hand and everything, which I think is incredibly important. Um, but it's kind of like one of those conundrums where if you're trying to do it, you're probably not going to do it if you're, it's just a weird, it's a weird thing that needs to kind of happen automatically. Mm-hmm. And, um, is that different in baseball? Cause usually in baseball, you, you think more about kind of holding off, right? Yeah. And, and obviously there's going to be in baseball, like it's a much more horizontal swing path. So the lead mm-hmm. arm is going to be much more pronounced. Whereas in like a long drive swing, it's much more vertical. So it looks a lot more like the torso is rotating while the lead arm is basically holding. But that's exactly what I'm talking about. So when we put the lead arm throws on the K-Vest, what we really saw was, and this is a problem with doing uh, top hand stuff, at least with baseball players. If you do too much top hand and all you focus on is top hand, top hand, top hand, your kinetic sequence starts to look like this. The pelvis starts to go, the torso starts to go, and now the hands are already going super early. And when the hands start to accelerate early, it doesn't really matter what you do everywhere else because we're missing out on that stretch type effect that that should happen in the swing to create as much leverage as you can into the swing. So guys start to almost get a little like T-Rex type arms when they think top hand first, top hand first, because it's it, it really doesn't you know lend itself well to creating a full rotational sequence. Mm-hmm. So you do want to make sure that like if you are focusing on top hand, you have to like keep that top hand away from going as long as you can. And it's really hard to think about that. Like it's like, at least in the baseball world, like top hand is like associated with ground balls. It's associated with get your, get going with your swing. Now get going, get going. And it's like, no, you can sequence and you will get going on time when you need to. And if you have enough bat speed, Even if you started your hands a little later, you're going to catch up because of all that barrel speed. And when you do catch up, now you're going to do more damage because your barrel was moving so fast. And so I think if I was to train long drivers with the lead arm throws, I would just try to like relay that information to them. Like the throw matters, but I would say it matters more that you are like holding that ball back. And you're, you're really sequencing well with everything else. And then the hand is just the last thing to go. The hand will come through when it comes through. And if you're producing a lot of velocity, then you probably did it well. So that, that would be my thing. I guess it's also a challenge too because 
the long drive throws are so much more vertical or like, like the pull is so much more vertical. Mm -hmm. So it would almost be like it would maybe lend itself well to throw the ball at like the bottom or the base of a wall if it was like eight feet out in front of you. Whereas in baseball, you want that 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 horizontal and almost like an upward swinging action early with your hands. So maybe you'd want to do your lead arm throws like what we do. We try to think like throw a line drive to the center fielder. That might not work so well with the long drive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but so but that's are you are you saying then that you that you want to have the lower body and the hips feel and be but but feel much more open relative to the arms and hands? Yeah, and if it's not like truly open, as long as there is like rotation happening, and the hand is like the lead arm hand is back behind the body, like. There's some baseball players that are very like closed, linear type hitters. They're not very rotational, but they still achieve a lot of the same positions. So as long as you're getting to that deeply stretched position where you can see like through the lead arm, there is a lot of leverage that's happening right now. Basically, yeah. if you're thinking about it, like you want your lead hand, like your bottom hand on the bat or the club to be as far from your midline as possible. Wait, 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 wait. The – the lead hand. So you mean the, like if you're a right-handed hitter, your your left hand you're talking about. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And now, so we're we're rotated back just a little bit, ready to swing. When it's time to go with your hands, you want that to be as far this way from your midline as possible. If they're in here super tight and you start your swing, you almost have to be like such a massively big, strong dude to produce any force in that short time frame that it's going to be very difficult to do. And so there are some guys that, and I, I know long drive is like this as well, where they don't achieve huge back swings. And in baseball, there's guys that don't produce like huge lead arm extension backwards and they still produce good power. So that's fine. That happens, but they're more like the rare category yeah. of, of yeah. players. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's really only a couple long drivers that I can think of that have a, a short backswing but still mm -hmm. are fast. Yeah, it, it is rare. But it's counterintuitive what you're saying because, to, at least to me, it feels – and feeling obviously is different for everybody. But it seems like if I'm kind of like holding holding off, waiting for that uh, final release to come, that it's never really going to. Like it's going to be too yeah. late of a release. So how do you assure that the hands and, and arms actually do achieve that final max velocity if you're well, trying to hold off? Yeah, and, and that's where having the radar gun out will tell you. So I've had this exact discussion with multiple <laughs> kids, like not like not too long, maybe a couple weeks ago. And so what we were talking about was this one kid, he's a very like I call it a pushy swing, where the, like the top hand is in the driver's seat and the top hand is going, 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 and it's like he's not producing a whole lot of exit velocity because his bat just doesn't have time to speed up. And he's a like a contact only hitter. And so what I was trying to tell him is like, no, if the velocity on this radar gun is good, like you did it. So let's figure out a way to make it happen. And, and so the cue that I gave him was imagine like you are um, like a spaghetti noodle at first with this two pound ball in your hand. Like you're, you're super whippy, you're super loose and then he throws it, and it wasn't that great of a throw, but you could tell he started to sequence it. Now you say, okay, now let's be a little less spaghetti-ish. Let's be a little tighter, and now let's really speed things up. And he started to figure it out from there. So sometimes getting to an extreme cue, like just be so relaxed you feel nothing, no muscle is on, that works sometimes with guys. Because I would say by and large the guys who really struggle with this – are either so weak they can't like get into those positions like they're just like like this two pound ball feels heavy in my hand so like if I created any leverage I feel like I would lose control or they're they're actually like super strong tightly wound guys but they're like almost afraid to like turn things off because they're so used to like being tense when they swing it's like no it's okay to relax a little bit and let your body start to work and let let it start to rotate because that's going to create that type of efficient kinetic mm -hmm. sequence that you want. And it's so counterintuitive, though, not to just keep repeating myself, but 
it is counterintuitive. You're you're because you go to the gym and you train and you get tight and you know you train building tension. Like if you're going to do a bench, you lock your you know your shoulders in your arm, like everything like that. And that's how you kind of get used to creating maximal force. So then if you go out and you swing like a spaghetti noodle and you feel really loose and whippy, it just doesn't feel like you're actually working. And Mm -hmm. then you see the speeds, you're like, oh, that is faster. Uh, But there's this one, there's this one guy who's one of the fastest long drivers out there. And I think he comes from a, uh, maybe a javelin background or some kind of track and field. And he has like a very kind of just loose, fluid looking swing and then hits it super fast. And it's funny to see the difference Mm -hmm. then. Like, so the two guys that I'm thinking of as like total opposites would be Mark Costello, who's the guy I mentioned there, where it, it's like a pretty loose, um, it almost looks like a relaxed swing. And then mm-hmm. Ryan Winther, who is um, former world champion, and he has the shortest backswing that I've ever seen. His shoulders turn like 30 degrees or something, mm-hmm. but he's as well one of the fastest guys out there when he's healthy. And um, it's just amazing to see the differences. So Yeah, and, and so if you ever wanted to like, Think about it in a little bit simpler of a term. The way that I like to do it is just think about a jump. There are some athletes who can jump 40 inches, 35 inches, whatever, crazy verticals, but they need to bend their knees all the way down to like 90 to get there. And then there's some guys, for whatever reason, like they use the stretch shortening cycle much better and they can maybe bend halfway down and still get 35 inches. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. in fact, getting lower for them doesn't usually achieve greater and vertical jump. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. And it's, it's why like our job is sometimes difficult because, all right, we're training these guys that, you know, I think he would do well with this exercise or this mode of thinking. But the reality is like, it just doesn't click with them sometimes. So everybody's different. And that's the challenge of it. Like not everybody's going to respond the same way to these exercises. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me jump back again because I got distracted. But I wanted to ask you, do you think the the weight difference between a baseball bat and a golf club changes how much separation or how much lag should be in that in the sequencing as you're hitting? I would imagine it's easier to have the lower body be beating the upper body with a baseball bat because it's got to be heavier than a, than a golf club. Yes. And it, and you are correct. So the other thing with that is pairing that same concept now with a pitch is coming at you. What basically a lot of um, good baseball players, at least their trigger is their lower body. So now they're visualizing a pitch. It's coming in and they say, OK, it's time to start my swing. I'm going to fire my lower half. And then if you imagine like Um, a hitter takes a pitch. A good hitter usually looks like their lower half is starting to fire and then their body holds at the last possible moment before they start to swing. That's exactly it. Like your lower half needs to fire to get that bat going, to get that two pound bat going. So Mm. you're right. And then I would say with long drive, it's you want that club to take time to bend. And I noticed this myself early on, like I was swinging an extra stiff shaft because everybody told me I was going to break it over my back if I didn't. And so I'm swinging this club and I'm like, I'm looking at it in slow motion. I know it's an extra stiff shaft, but there should still be some bend in it. But my swing almost looks like super, like, like the, the club just looks straight the whole time. I'm like, no wonder this is 125 club head speed. Like there's no bend in the club at all. So there's no whip happening. And so you do have to figure out like ways to, apply force into the implement to get it to bend. And that's obviously much more of a thing in long drive than it is in baseball. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, even though you will see like, like Mike Trout can bend his bat a little bit in slow motion or John Carlos Stanton can um, it's, you know, it's much more pronounced obviously in a long drive uh, competitor. So that's another piece of the component too. It's like the, the whippiness actually happens through the club head you know, kind of staying back behind the head as the body begins to create that pull. It's a Mm -hmm. very interesting concept though. Um, And on that, I actually did a little like video on this myself. It was over the summertime, I want to say, but like back when I was swinging, I was swinging at a, like a park outside if just for the swing speed radar. And I was looking, I'm like, man, my swing speed suck today. Like what's happening. (laughs) And I saw that. And so what I noticed was, Oh, I can't remember. It was called I think it was called lag. It was the word that I, I actually found when I looked it up. 
but basically like creating this angle here with your wrists as long as you could as you begin to create like that downwards angle with the uh, with the golf club but with a baseball bat creating lag is not always the best thing at least not in that same exact way you want to create that leverage but sometimes if you have a pitch that's like a low pitch in the zone it's almost good to let your barrel out because it's got to get down there and if you kept mm. it super tight to your body and then you go to attack that low pitch you're just going to chop through it so it's a very interesting thing that that like I think just through my baseball playing days like I don't want to think like the top hand stays locked as long as it needs to in order to um you know create a lot of club head speed sometimes but it's just an interesting observation I've had so in that scenario when you want the club to start a little bit earlier that's just for ball contact right like if you were still looking for maximum speed you would want more of the lag correct yes okay. but yeah, like like I said in a game it's a lot more difficult right and so right. this is a real thing for you baseball fans that are out there uh, listening. If you were to measure maximal bat speed in like an easy thing, like a T swing, it would be about five or six miles per hour higher than what these MLB players are doing in a game when they're facing 90, 95. There is that component. As fast as these guys swing on TV, like they still have more in the tank if they were to swing at max effort off of the T or something like that. Yeah, it's a, I'm sure it's a similar situation for PGA Tour players who are out there and they're a little more interested in where the ball is going rather than the max distance. But yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know if you've been following Bryson DeChambeau at all, but his progress of gaining tons of speed um, has, I think, I mean, he's he's shown that it has helped his game a lot and hitting it farther does help your game. So um let me see. So again, like I feel like I'm jumping around a little bit, and I, you know, mm -hmm. rather than just normal flow. But um, I wanted to ask you, what's the weight distribution on at impact in a baseball swing? Is your do you are you shifting into the lead side? Are you pushing off of it? How does that work? Um, it that varies quite a bit. It actually varies from different pitches as well. So if you were to go maximal bat speed off of a tee. Uh, if you looked at the ground force, the front foot would see a lot of force. Like it would be quite a spike into the front leg. And if anybody uh, listening has seen like Bryce Harper's swing, that's basically what it would look like. Like he has probably the most max effort type of swing that you'll find in like the big leagues. Um, you know, where that back foot is literally like completely off the ground on mm. front foot strike. Whereas there's m different types of hitters like Juan Soto, for instance, he looks almost like he's squatting the entire time as he's rotating. And so it doesn't look like he transfers quite as much into the front foot. I'm sure he does, but it doesn't look like it. But on like a curveball or something that you're fooled a little bit, the front foot takes on some force. But instead of like it looking like a spike on a ground force monitor, it would look like a small hill. It's very interesting, and that's mm. how baseball players sort of buy time is by like, okay, I sort of put a little bit of force onto my front foot, and then I try to like spike it at the end as I'm getting into contact. But yeah, I would I would imagine it on a max effort swing would look similar to long drive, but even then, like I I looked at a paper the other day on long drive. This is maybe a, about a month ago, and I remember seeing. There's some people that produce a ton of force like in a very vertical fashion. Mm -hmm. And then there's some people that are driving the same distance that it looks almost like a triangle like or, or kind of like an angular type of ground force production. It's very weird. And, yeah, the uh, way I've heard it is there are three ways that you can use yes. that ground interaction. You can have the vertical, just how hard are you pushing in. There can be the one that's a little harder to measure, the rotational, like you said, like how – you know, the, the torque that you're putting into the ground. And then there's like a translational one as well. And like you said, you can have people that are, that are swinging the same speed and the, the vertical force could be so much less or so much more, more on one person, depending on how they're creating that individual speed themselves. Yeah. And, and so as far as like the ground forces go, it's really interesting to look at how differently athletes will go about producing that force and how, it does look different on you know the ground force production between each guy, but yeah, to your point, like the three different ways of producing 
long drive. It's incredible because, all right, there's one singular goal. It's just hit the ball farther than everybody else. And mm-hmm. it's so interesting that there's even then there's still like three ways just to produce ground force. Mm-hmm. And now you can think of multiple ways of loading the club back, creating bend in the club, um, and, and all that sort of thing. So that's it, there's there's so many different ways of being a great long drive competitor, or being a great baseball player. But there are um, common things, I guess, that you can see like force transfer and being able to obviously rotate massively fast. And that's really what you're you're looking to see in, in strength training perspectives. Are there any baseball training devices that that are like I have I use the lag shot. They're they're a sponsor of the podcast. Awesome product. Um, and it got a really flexible shaft. So it teaches mm-hmm. you to how to you know kind of load it better and then whip through and release better. Is there anything like that in baseball? Um, I'm sure there is. And if I'm being honest with you, like I'm very anti drills. Okay. But I, I know somebody has come in with something like that before. But what we were doing is we were just using a PVC pipe the one day to try to create that kind of like a not a super stiff one, but like a medium flex PVC pipe just to try to create that whip at the start of the swing. Um, that's how we were kind of training it. But, yeah, there's a lot of drills out there that I'll be honest with you. I just I'm a very old school guy. I just fire the machine up and have it throw the fast, nasty stuff at them. And then I'll throw live at bats. And, you know, I, I just basically, I try to keep it as old school as possible. And if the guys want to do drills and so be it, they'll do them. So, but what, if, but what if you had like a device that, that you could hit balls with, but it was different than a normal bat? Is that still what you would call a drill? Uh, yeah, I would, I would call that a drill, but okay. I guess it's, yeah, like you said, like, if we're doing fairly traditional batting practice with something like that, I guess that would that would make uh, a little more sense. Actually, now that you mention it, Fitzgerald actually has been coming in with this bat. Um, it's like it's got this weird like whippy end thing to it. I, it's called like a velocity pro bat or something, but he mm. loves it. And so he can actually hit like off of the machine with it. It's like great. Like that's awesome that you found something that you 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 do enjoy using. So. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's it'll be different for everybody though. I won't impose it on anybody. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Tell me a little bit about the throw. I don't know. I don't remember the name, but where you're going like all the way back and and throwing mm-hmm. overhead because that one looks yeah. pretty cool. I haven't tried it yet. Yeah, the, so I call it a supine overhead throw, but I mean I've heard people call it a pullover throw. I've called you know everything, but the that throw is like okay. So I always wanted to measure a med ball slam how fast guys could med ball slam because we would do med ball slams all the time in our training, but it's like, there's no feedback. And it's just like, well, how do I know guys are really giving like their best effort? Because that's the thing. Like we talk a lot about all this speed training. If you're not giving very close to, or your best effort, it won't matter at all. There is no impact that will be had. You're not going to see any speed gains. And that goes for medicine ball throws. So we're doing these med ball slams and I'm like, I'm, I think we had a push band for a while that measured slam speed, but then the push band stopped working and they got bought out by a uh, whoop, I believe. And so I haven't been able to measure med ball slams at all. And so we just said, screw it. We're just going to go with either the Proteus or the, the lying on the back med ball throws for the radar gun. And it's been the best exercise. Like guys absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. I think the reason that I like it the most is and this is going to sound a little uh like counterintuitive i guess when okay we do all these med ball throws and we're on our feet all the time right the problem with that is and that's great but the problem is guys start to think about mechanics too much oh what's my back hip doing oh what is my front foot doing how is it striking the ground like Baseball players want to think about mechanics. That's just how they're wired 90% of the time. So rather than thinking, like putting them in a position like that, I would rather than just say, okay, you're lying on a Swiss ball or you have your back uh, on a medicine ball or something. There are no mechanics to this. You just throw the piss out of it as hard as you can and you're going to see results. And so that's kind of why I like it. It's, it's the one movement that is sort of free – from having your feet on the ground, mm-hmm. it, it gets guys away from thinking about mechanics, really. And uh, 
yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, I would say the the one issue that I do come across with it sometimes is guys struggle um, almost releasing the ball. So if you imagine like a basketball pass, like you get it perfectly off your fingertips and it whips out of your hands. Sometimes guys have that with the medicine ball throw. Other times they don't, and they throw like these knuckle balls, and it's it, you could just tell like yeah, there's another mile per hour or two that hmm. you're not getting because you're not really whipping the ball off your fingertips. So that does happen from time to time, but for the most part, guys will figure that out after a couple weeks of doing the exercise. Yeah, I would imagine, especially when you're when you're measuring it as closely as you are, you're gonna see. Oh wait, that one really rolled off and. And it was a mile an hour faster and you'll, you'll adapt to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to ask you kind of the last like big topic is, is the mental side of it. When you've put in all the work, you've trained all year, you're in competition now. How do you coach your players to perform mentally at the best? Man, that's a tough question. And I wish I would have done this better last year um, because a lot of guys went into the season performing super well. But at least in baseball, you're you're going to have a week where you're just you're failing like crazy. And so this is this would be my advice for the guys in this upcoming year. Understand that failure is not like a death sentence on how good your season is. Failure, having a bad week, a good, you know, uh, a good week followed by two bad weeks, whatever. Like it doesn't mean you suck anymore. You're like you're still a great player. You train to become a great player. It will even itself out and allow like this failure almost to teach you where you need to improve. And let's just see if you can get an inch better. Because let's say you had a week where every pitcher threw you sliders like crazy and you're bad at hitting sliders. Well, you probably had a bad week. You know, that's just what's going to happen. If you just say, oh, I suck at hitting, I can't hit, I'm just terrible, you're going to have a bad rest of the season. But if you put it in your mind that you say, okay, I'm going to get this much better at hitting sliders right now, that's going to help you for next season. That's going to help you become a good professional hitter. So all of these things come into play and understand that failure is going to be a part of it and that failure can teach you something if you really have a good mindset. But, you know, Ultimately, though, so the way that I approached it last year, I think, was fine as well. The way I told guys was when you walk out on the field, you're the baddest dude on the planet. Like this pitcher, if he's going to throw you something over the plate, he's wrong. You're going to destroy it. Like have that that un sort of uh, unwavering confidence in yourself. And and it kind of lends itself to having a great start to the season, you know. But then as, as they start to fail and stuff. Uh, that almost unwavering confidence can turn it into um, sort of an unwavering doubt in yourself because now you say, oh, man, I've sucked for the past 20 at-bats. Now all of that confidence I had is gone. Now I have nothing. You need to be able to take that failure and not just use it as a negative but use it as positive as well. Mm -hmm. Do you give any like in the moment – I don't know if in baseball are there like swing thoughts? Do you – I remember actually when I was when I was really young, I played um, like like up I think up until high school I played played baseball, and I had this one little shirt and like their slogan for the whatever it was squish the bug and maybe that's like a common thing in baseball I don't know, but like do you tell people to have certain feelings or swing like swing thoughts like that? Yeah, and actually we do talk about those things quite a bit. Like, um, oh hey, like we worked on this today. Let's say we worked on. Uh, like this is a big one with baseball players, like not letting your head drift towards the pitcher, like not trying to go get the ball, especially when pitching gets faster. If you're trying to like lunge at the baseball, it's only going to make it look faster. So Mm -hmm. that's a big thing. And so what we'll work on in the cages is say, okay, really think like keep your head back. And then when we find that cue that fits with them, like let's say this athlete was thinking, keep his head back and he started crushing the baseball, just, have that whispering in your head all the time over and over and over again. And so when we find that cue, I do like to make sure that guys remember it and kind of like you said, like have it written on your shirt, have it written on your hat, have something that you can always go back to like and almost re- hit that reset button because you know that you can rely on this one cue to really get you there. Um, I had a good one in long drive actually. So 
as when I was hitting the ball, I had so many moments where I was just hitting like moonshot pop ups in with long drive. And I'm hitting the ball like probably, you know, it's taking like 15 seconds for it to come down sometimes, <laughs> but I'm literally like hitting the bottom of the ball with the top of my club. And mm-hmm. so my cue was just, I want to hit a low piss missile ground ball up the middle. That's all I want to do. And when I started doing that, that's when I started to hit balls that actually almost looked like golf shots where they start to rise and they really would go far when I did that. So yeah, when you find a cue that works, man, you ride it out. Like you do not stop whispering that in your head and it really Mm -hmm. helps keep the game or the, the, the competition simple because it's so easy to like have other things creep into your head and the moment you have multiple things, multiple mechanical things in your head, it's going to be bad news. It's going to be a tough day. Yeah, very bad news. And it's all too easy to do that in golf, I think. I mean, I come from a more of a tournament background, and a lot of people will teach you into technical things and positional swinging, and it's a good way to kill your speed and not really enjoy yourself. So yeah, not a good way to do it. Yeah, there was, I had a good conversation the other day with somebody who he played in the big leagues, and now he's playing out in Korea for baseball. And he said the one thing that he's noticed with all the baseball players he played with, uh, whether they're on the Yankees playing really good or somebody else and they just suck, he said the good players, they're all either incredibly smart or incredibly dumb. There's no in-between. Like You have to be a brain surgeon that understands every aspect of the game uh, or you just got to be turn your brain off and play baseball. That's how sports goes, man. It's, It's so weird like that. It is. And it's very true in, in golf as well. And it's hilarious to see. So some days I want to be dumber. Some days I want to be smarter, but (laughs) it's fun. Um, all right. So finally, when, when are we going to see you in long drive competition? I want to, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Well, shit, man. Uh, let's definitely try to get, I'm definitely going to sign up for something this summer. Like I don't care if I do well or not. Um, but yeah, I would say, I'll, I'm going to look it up right now. I'm sure there's one in Chicago because there was one this year, I think, in September. And I just couldn't go to it because I had so many athletes I was training. But, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to sign up for one. Let, like, let's plan for next summer. And I'm going to cool. sign up for one and I'm going to do it. And I don't give a crap if I drive 3.30 or 4.30. <laughs> like, I'm just going to let it fly and see what I can get. That's That's a good attitude, man, for sure. Well, thanks again. I really do appreciate your time and all the stuff you put up, put online. It's helped me a lot. And everybody go follow. Is it Bill Miller Training on Instagram? Mm-hmm. Yep. Bill Miller Training. A lot of good stuff. And um, I mean, it'll definitely help your training. I, a lot of these episodes, I talk about different philosophies. Try this, try that. What works for you? What, whatever. And your stuff has worked for me. And I know it'll it'll help a lot of other people as well. So thank you again. Right on. Hey, and, and on that topic, though, I'm a very open book when it comes to training stuff on Instagram or whatever. If you want to DM me, I'll always respond. And, uh, you know, I post a lot of explosive and experimental type exercises because I think they're cool. But if I'm being honest, like a lot of the training stuff that I do is very basic. And that's only maybe 10% is what I really show on Instagram. You know what I mean? Just to kind of keep it spicy. But yeah, so I'm always, I have no ego in, in training. It's, it's training. It's fun. I enjoy it. I like seeing athletes get better. That's all it's about. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can uh, do a little off-season training together and, and get faster yeah. and better for next season. Dude, that'd be sweet. Talk to you soon, Steve. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks.